Hello everyone and welcome to your chapter 27 prep screencast on the reproductive system. So we'll talk about the reproductive system in general. The primary sex organs, also known as gonads, are going to be the testes in a male and ovaries in a female. They are responsible for producing sex cells which are known as gametes. So the egg in a female and in the male it would be the sperm. They're also going to secrete steroid sex hormones, so androgens like testosterone in males, and in females, we have estrogen and progesterone. Um, and we will have lots of accessory reproductive organs, such as ducts, glands, and external genitalia. Um, so let's start off with our male reproductive system first. We will start off at the testes, which lie within the scrotum. Our testes are the um, necessary organs used to produce sperm, and we have to have that follicle-stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary lobe to stimulate sperm production in the testes. Um, we will continue through a duct system that you see pictured here in order for the sperm to be delivered out through the penis and um, into the vagina to flow all the way up through the uterus and to the fallopian tubes where the egg will become fertilized. So I have some uh, structures listed, ooh, sorry about that, some structures of the male um, reproductive system listed here. We're going to talk about these individually in, the, individually in the coming slides. But before we do that, let's mention the three major accessory sex sex glands in the female, uh, female, oh my gosh, in the male reproductive system. Can I get a sentence out? Okay, that is going to be our seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, which is one big gland here. Sorry, you hear my laundry machine going off. And we also have the bulbourethral gland, which is teeny tiny down here. It's also known as the Coper's gland. And most of these stru structures are located posterior and inferior to the urinary bladder. So all of these are grouped as accessory sex glands because they're emptying secretions. They're going to vary depending on uh, what gland it's coming from as far as what the substance that fluid is made up of, but they flow through ducts in each of these glands and into um, the urethra to end up in the ejaculation uh, substance, which is semen. All right, so I'm going to walk you through real quick where um, sperm is going to flow through. So we said that sperm production is taking place in the testes within the scrotum. This is lying outside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. From there, the sperm will move into a C or cup-shaped structure here posterior to the testes known as the epididymis. This is where sperm is maturing. From there, we flow back into the vas deferens or the ductus deferens, and this continues on up making its way into the pelvic cavity, superior to the urinary bladder, and then will come to join the, um, the seminal vesicle uh, back in here. This is the ampulla of the ductus deferens. Here is the seminal vesicle duct. So we have two ducts coming together here. Here's the vas deferens, or ductus deferens, and here's the duct of the seminal vesicle. That then will become the ejaculatory duct. And we are now in the prostate gland here. So this ejaculatory duct is moving through the prostate gland and then will turn into the urethra. And because we're in the prostate, we call this the prosthetic urethra. Then we have a little bit of a middle portion that's very short. Um, we call this the membranous urethra once we're out of the prostate gland. And this joins the duct of our bulbourethral gland. So once we come together with that bulbourethral gland, we change the name of our urethra again, and it's now known as the penile urethra or spongy urethra. And I'll tell you why this is called spongy urethra in a moment. And it moves out the external urethral orifice. Now when we were talking about the urinary system, we mentioned how the male uses its urethra for its reproductive system to let the semen out, but also um, it works in our urinary system to let the urine out as well. So here's our urinary bladder, and here's that prosthetic urethra that the urine would drain through and move out through the spongy urethra once again. Okay, so 
We mentioned the testes are sitting within the scrotum. Um, it's just a sack of skin and superficial fascia. Uh, fascia. We're going to talk about some layers in class. Like I mentioned, it hangs out of the abdominal pelvic cavity and it's outside the cavity so that it's three degrees Celsius lower than our core body temperature. And this is the temperature that's necessary for sperm production to take place. All right, now inside the testes we have these teeny tiny tubules i always like to think of them as like little ramen noo little ramen noodles and the sperm is created within these tubules and will move out from the seminiferous tubules do i have these highlighted i don't um from the seminiferous tubules into the tubulus rectus which i have indicated for you down here, but each of these seminiferous tubules has its own tubulus rectus, and then that moves into this mesh-like area, which is called the ret testes. From there, we'll move the sperm into the efferent tubules and into the epididymis where that sperm will mature. So how are we um, giving blood supply here? It's coming from the testicular arteries and testicular veins within the spermatic cord. So let me show you a different view here of the spermatic cord. Here's the scrotum down in here, and here's the testes, there's the epididymis. And we have this cord that gets created that is filled with arteries and veins and nerves and the lymphatic vessels um, in order to give supply to uh, the testes and epididymis, and also the ductus deferens, um, which also travels within the spermatic cord. So there's our autonomic nerve fibers, which would be our nerves. We have our pempimiform plexus of the testicular veins, our testicular artery, and this is just a close-up of our testes. We already talked about this, so I won't go through it again. All right, now let's talk about the penis a little bit more. We mentioned that toward the end of the penis, we have that spongy urethra. Now, in the cadaver lab, I will find one or have to do it myself, slice the penis in half like this. When we do that, you see this view over here. Um, one of my friends, when I was studying anatomy and physiology, said it looked like a smiley face. Here are the eyes, and there's the mouth. The, not really smiling, but anyway, it does the job. So our spongy urethra is going to be down in the bottom here, and it's surrounded by some erectile tissue, and this tissue is going to be a spongy network of connective tissue and smooth muscle, and it has vascular spaces that can fill, um, uh, well, excuse me, let me make this clear. The, the tissue up here has more of the vascular spaces for blood to fill through. That's why we have these two deep arteries here. Um, and this one is more of just the spongy tissue because we don't want blood to fill up too much here. That would um, not allow the semen to move through the urethra. Okay, so let me tell you what these tissues are called. Now, these two up here have the same name, the tissue you see in blue. This is the corpus cavernosa or corpora cavernosa for plural. Um, and like I mentioned, we have the deep arteries in there. So when a male gets an erection, this is the tissue that's being filled with blood. Um, and that causes the penis to enlarge and become rigid. And our other tissue down here surrounding the spongy urethra, that's going to be the corpus spongiosum. And we only have one of these. Um, it is going to expand to form the glands uh, the glands penis, and also the bulb, which would be right in here. And this is another view of all of those structures we mentioned. So they've sliced the penis in half here. Here's the urinary bladder, our um, ductus deferens connecting with the seminal vesicle here. We got the ejaculatory duct turning into the prosthetic urethra, membranous urethra, there's our bulbourethral gland, and our spongy urethra continuing on down. Now this surrounding over here is gonna be the corpus spongiosum, and then what we see on the lateral sides here and here, that's our corpus or corpora cavernosa. And I just wanted to highlight these structures for you in a different view. There's our epididymis where sperm matures, our ductus deferens or vas deferens, 
our ejaculatory duct. Remember, we have to connect with the um, seminal vesicle here as well. This really is a continuation of the ductus deferens. This outpouching here is just the ampulla of the ductus deferens. And lastly, we have the entire urethra, but like we said, we have three different parts of that urethra. So our ductus deferens, we started off here at the testes, sperm was made, put into the epididymis, and then it's gonna pass through the ductus deferens. And the ductus deferens is passing through an area known as the inguinal canal. So I'm gonna show you a different view of what that looks like um, in class. And after we continue above the urinary bladder, that outpouching, once again, is gonna be the ampulla, and that is joining the duct of the, I'm gonna show you a different view here. Here's our ampulla, okay? That's joining the duct of our seminal vesicle, and when those two come together, they create the ejaculatory duct. Now, this is symmetrical in a male, but those two ejaculatory ducts come together to create the prosthetic urethra. Um, and, you may have heard of males getting a vasectomy when they don't want children anymore. This involves a cutting and ligating of the ductus deferens, which is nearly 100% effective form of birth control. All right, um, we already talked about this extensively, so I don't think I have to go through this again. Um, let's move into spermatogenesis. That is the process in which we are going to produce sperm. Um, from the seminiferous tubules within the testes. So we have to go through a process of mitosis first um, where we are just dividing our cells here and these are called spermatogonia. They're basically the babyest type of sperm that you can get. So most of our body cells are gonna be diploid or 2N and are gonna contain two sets of chromatones chromosomes, which comes from one from our mother and one set from our father. Um, and we will have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. Our gametes are going to be different. They are going to be haploid cells and will contain 23 chromosomes alone. Spermatic cells are going to give rise to the sperm. So like I said, we go through, my, ooh, we go through mitosis first. We duplicate those cells and um, we're gonna form spermatocytes. So first we have a primary spermatocyte. Um, and in order to do this, we have to go through meiosis one. So we go through the process of meiosis one and we end up with secondary spermatocytes. We go through meiosis two and then we end up with four spermatids. Now we go through a separate process. This is different from spermatogenesis we go through spermiogenesis. So this is one of the um, terms that you have to be really careful reading on your exam that you don't mix up these two. This process is when the spermatid becomes a spermatozoa. And in order to do that, let me switch slides here. The computer doesn't wanna work. Okay, hopefully this will happen in a minute. In order to do that, oh, there we go. We need to lose the cytoplasm and form a tail. So you could see that process taking place here. Um, here's our spermatids. You see that they are starting to add microtubules toward the end here, moving all of the cell organelles and everything more toward the, um, the head area. And we also want the mitochondria to line up along the tail um, so that we have uh, this area um, to supply lots of energy and allow a movement of the flagellum, the tail of the sperm. Um, and what else did I wanna mention? We have all the gen genetic material within the nucleus and that ends up staying in the head of the sperm. Um, and you could see here that the cytoplasm is almost like drooping off of the spermatid. And this is just the picture in your book, I believe, of um, that process taking place. Okay, let's jump into the female reproductive system. Our ovaries are going to be the primary reproductive um, organ here. Um, and its main purpose is to produce the egg or the ova. Well, it'll also secrete estrogen and progesterone. And 
other accessory ducts are going to be the uterine tubes. Now our, our uterine tubes have three different names. Number one is uterine tube, number two is fallopian tube, and number three is the oviduct. They all refer to the same thing, this duct right here. That connects to the uterus, and below the uterus we have the vagina. Okay, so internal genitalia, we already talked about external genitalia. Um, I'm going to talk about that in class. I don't think it's necessary to go through it right here. Um, this is a trans, uh, not transverse, a sagittal cut through the reproductive system here. So you see the ovary here on the lateral side. This is our fallopian tube connecting to the uterus, and our uterus leads to the vagina. You do see some of the external uh, female reproductive structures here like the clitoris and the labia minora, labia majora. Um, we also have these vestibular or um, Bartholin glands. Um, and I think those are all the structures that we're going to talk about that are illustrated here. So um, we'll also be learning a lot of about a lot of different ligaments. I'm just going to mention a couple here. We'll mention the rest in class because there are just so many of them. Um, we have the ovarian ligament, or this is also known as the proper ovarian ligament, and this attaches our ovary to the medial surface of the uterus, and it just helps to hold it in place. We also have a suspensory ligament of the ovary, and this is taking our ovary and attaching it to the lateral pelvic wall. And then we have our mesovarium, um, and this will just help to suspend the ovary. I also want to mention that this is a part of the broad ligament, and the broad ligament, it's a big area. It's all of this in here, and so we have decided to, not me, but people have decided to name uh, different portions of this broad ligament. So we'll talk about all of those different parts in class, but it really just helps to hold um, these accessory reproductive structures and ovary in place um, so that things don't shift around too much. And this is just another picture illustrating all of that stuff. Let's talk about our ovaries now. I think the most difficult part of the female reproductive system is understanding what's going on in the ovary. So when you look inside an ovary, of course you have um, maturation of the egg taking place. And so we're going to start off right over here um, at, the, at the primordial follicles. Let me see if I started this lecture too far back. Okay, I didn't. Um, why is this slide out of place? Anyway, let's talk about it on the next slide first and then we'll go in order. So we'll start here at the primordial follicles and you might have 6 to 11 of these and then um, a couple uh, not a couple. One is chosen, and um, we are going to uh, see that they have a very flat line cells, and I think I took these slides out um, to make this short, but we'll see them in class. Um, these flat-like cells, so we're going to call them squamous-like follicle cells, and when you think follicle, I don't want you to think follicle like a hair follicle. Think of lots of cells layering one another. Um, so these flat cells are kind of layered all next to one another, and they're surrounding the oocyte or the egg. Next, it's going to turn into a primary follicle. So now we not only have one layer of flat cells, but we actually have cube or column-like cells surrounding the oocyte. Then that'll turn into a secondary follicle, which we're, we will have two or more layers of granulosa cells. And granulosa cells are important because they are going to secrete estrogen and progesterone for us. And this is all surrounding the oocyte or the egg. And then we have our late, ooh, our late secondary follicle that's going to consist of um, a fluid-filled fluid space. This is also known as the antrum. And um, we have our granulosa cells still surrounding the oocyte, but also around the periphery as well. Um, let's move into our ovulation. So that secondary, what did we call this on the last slide? Secondary, late secondary follicle is also known as the vesicular 
or graphene follicle. So it really has three different names. Um, and what happens is when this follicle fills with the antrum, that fluid-filled area, it pushes this oocyte into one area, so it's bulging. And when that um, gets filled so much, we know that it's time for ovulation, and it is going to push that egg out of the ovary so that it can ovulate. It can go into the fallopian tube. Um, the, remaining, the remaining cells, those granulosa cells, will turn into something known as a corpus luteum, um, which means flower. Um, and it kind of does. It looks like a flower. I think I have a picture of like what it looks like in real life, and it looks like a yellow flower. So, um, and that's going to uh, secrete some hormones for us, which we'll talk about in a minute. So this is a illustration um, from your textbook. Same thing going on here. This picture, I believe, I took from one of my physiology textbooks. So, um, but like I said, same thing going on. Okay, we talked about the duct system. Let's talk about it a little bit more specifically. So our uterine tube or fallopian tube, we have a couple different parts to it. Once again, we have an outpouched area, and this is known as the ampulla, um, and where we see a more distal expansion of this, that'll be known as the infundibulum. And this is found the closest to the ovary. And on those ends, we'll have little finger-like projections known as fimbriae. So that egg is ovulating from the ovary, and the fimbriae say, hey, hey, little guy there, come on over. And so the egg flows right in through here. And usually the ampulla that is the distal third of the fallopian tube is where fertilization is going to take place. So it takes place in the fallopian tube in the distal third of the fallopian tube. Then once it's fertilized, it can continue down its journey through the fallopian tube and um, implant on the uterine wall. Uh, and the last thing I needed to mention on our fallopian tube is going to be the isthmus. And this is just a constricted region where the tube joins the uterus. Now, you may be thinking, hey, isthmus, that sounds familiar. Didn't she mention something about Christmas and a bow tie? Oh, yes. The thyroid gland also has a isthmus as well, and it's just that narrowed area between the two lobes of the thyroid. So this isthmus term is used throughout the body. It's just a narrowed or constricted region of um, a tuber gland or organ. Okay, let's talk about the uterus. Now we have a cervical canal here that helps the vagina communicate with the uterus. So there's the vagina in the slower portion, and the area where it it uh, comes closest to the cervical canal, that's known as the external os. And then the uterine body, where that cervical canal ends, um, that's going to be the internal os. Our cervical glands, oh, I don't have a picture of that, are going to secrete mucus that will block sperm entry during mid-cycle. Okay, now we have three different layers here in the uterine wall. We have the perimetrium, peri meaning surrounding, metrium referring to the uterus, and that's the serous layer or visceral peritoneum. We have myometrium, myo meaning muscle, metrium meaning um, uterus, and this is smooth muscle, by the way. And lastly, we have the endometrium, which endo meaning inside, metrium meaning uterus. So it's the inner lining, which is made up of mucosa in the uterus. Okay, so this endometrium actually has two different layers. We have the stratum functionalis, which is also known as the functional layer here, and this is going to be the one that sheds during menstruation, and it changes as far as its thickness um, depending on our ovarian hormone cycles. So the uh, estrogen and progesterone within our body. And then the deeper layer here is the basal layer or the stratum basalis, and this forms the new functional layer after menstruation because after menstruation that this functional layer it's all shedded away and so that's why the basal layer is responsible for helping um, a rebuild of the functional layer and this is unresponsive to over ovarian hormones which is why it's great to have it there to rebuild that functional layer 
Okay, quick little tidbit about our mammary glands. They are modified sweat glands, and we have about 15 to 25 lobes. Um, the areola would be that nipple area. It's pigmented, and it surrounds the nipple. We have suspensory ligaments, which let me show you where those are, um, that are going to attach to the breast, and we have our pectoralis major underlying there that it'll attach to. So what happens? How is this milk produced? Well, first of all, we need to know that prolactin helps with milk production. That's secreted from the anterior pituitary gland, right? So we get milk production occurring in these alveoli within the um, mammary gland, and this flows through the ductal, down the duct, and eventually through the lactifer, lactifer, oh my gosh, I can't talk, lactiferous ducts, and through the lactiferous sinus and out the nipple pores. Um, now, because this is a modified sweat gland, it is also a part of the integumentary system. And remember, we also need oxytocin, which comes from the posterior pituitary gland, but is synthesized from the hypothalamus that will allow milk letdown. So it lets the milk move from these um, lobes down into uh, out the nipple pores. Um, and this is just a slide showing you the, um, the path of the milk continuing on down. Um, secretion of progesterone is going to stimulate the preparation of the mammillary glands for lactation. And we'll talk about that in chapter 28. Okay, so um, these next couple slides, we're going to talk about a couple different cycles within the female reproductive system. The ovarian cycle is going to be a monthly series of events that will help the egg mature. And this happens in um, two consecutive phases. We have ovulation occurring right in the middle of that. So we have our follicular phase. This is a period of follicle growth takes place usually between the days 1 and 14, and the later phase is the luteal phase, and this helps our corpus luteum um, take place and then uh, degrade itself into a corpus albican. And um, like I mentioned, right in the middle, we're going to have ovulation take place, and usually this is around day 14, and you want to memorize these phases in order. Okay. So within our ovarian cycle, we are going to have some hormones that will affect uh, the maturation of the egg. So let's take a look, and this is a, um, a chart from my uh, human physiology textbook by Fox, and um, your book has this as well, but I liked this chart more because it kind of puts everything all together for you to see in one place instead of separate um, separate figures. So if we look at the top here, we see the levels of FSH and LH. Remember that comes from your anterior pituitary gland. And the releasing hormone coming from your hypothalamus is triggering the release of these hormones. So we see that they are at a moderate level here. Um, and this is allowing for the growth of our follicles here from that primary follicle into a secondary or mature follicle and it allows for estrogen release. Now when we have estrogen at this level it kind of keeps our FSH and LH at lower levels not high like we see mid-cycle here and it's also going to stimulate the synthesis and storage of SH, FSH and LH until we're ready um, for a huge surge of it and the, uh, this estrogen is kind of like a positive feedback um, feedback loop. It, the more estrogen we get, the more it wants to further secrete, the more estrogen we get. So that's why we see this rise in estrogen here. Um, let's move. Okay, there we go. And once we get that high level of estrogen, you could see that this high level is right before we see the high level of LH and FSH. That is giving us our mature vesicular follicle, and estrogen levels are going to be super high um, that it'll affect the pituitary gland mid-cycle, and we suddenly get that big LH surge. Um, 
if you've seen those ovulation tests at the pharmacy, that's what the tests are detecting is how much LH you have um, and whether you're going through ovulation or not to, to enhance your chance of getting pregnant. So what does this LH surge mean? It means we have a completion of meiosis 1, so we get our secondary oocyte that continues on to metaphase 2. We'll talk more about this in class. Um, like we said, it'll trigger ovulation and it'll transform that ruptured follicle into the corpus luteum within our luteal phase. And other functions of our corpus luteum is that it's going to produce inhibin. Inhibin really works to inhibit FSH. So that's why we see that low level down in here. Um, it's also going to produce progesterone and estrogen, which is why we see rises down in here. Um, and uh, we're, we'll also see uh, an end to this luteal phase. It'll become a um, corpus albicans here and inhibit further follicle development until the cycle happens all over again. And I already mentioned this, how our corpus luteum is going to degenerate um, and our ovarian hormone levels are going to drop as well as the gonadotropin um, levels and the cycle starts all over again. Okay, so that is the end of your prep screencast. Um, we'll talk more about this chart in class. I'll print off copies for you guys and we'll talk about the menstrual cycle as well. So if you have any questions before then, please feel free to text or email me and I will see you tomorrow.